All right. There is a couple events that have been happening recently that got me thinking on, the, on a very important subject that I think needs to be preaching on. It's not something new. I'm sure you've probably heard about this before. But um, the subject I'm going to be preaching on today is hate speech. Everyone's familiar with that term, and you've probably heard sermons on it in the past as well. But um, this is something that just seems to be more weaponized and people are just accepting the term and starting to use it more and more, especially against Christians, against Bible believers. And it's something that we need, we need to be aware of and that we need to just fully understand and be able to fight against. Now, I'm going to start off before we even get into the hate speech aspect. Just in general terms, as Bible believers, we need to make sure that we are not easily offended in anything, that we're not people who are just easily offended, you know, and, and we just get all upset over every little thing. And if someone says something that you don't like, you're just, a, oh, no, I'm, you know, and you get all upset over things. We were, we're, we're turning into a snowflake society in general. And that's the way the, the children seem to be get raised more and more with this type of a mindset and this type of an attitude of just getting offended over every little thing. And that is not the way that Bible believers are supposed to be. I mean, the world is going to end up going down that road. It already is. We see it happening more and more. But that is not the way that we are supposed to be. We started off here in Matthew chapter 11. And Jesus is talking about John the Baptist. We have the story here. John's in prison. And he actually comes, he has this time of doubt where he's just wondering, like, is this really, Jesus? Is, is this the one? Is this the Christ? You know, he had, he's in prison. There's all this stuff's happening. He might have been expecting Jesus to set up his kingdom because a lot of people were expecting that to happen. So he's just wondering, like, is, it, is this, are you the right person? And Jesus answers. He says, look, tell John, you know, all these things. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the deaf hear, you know, all, all the things that he's doing. He's fulfilling all the prophecies just to, to comfort and settle John's heart that, yes, he is the one who is to come. It is Jesus. And then he responds to everyone else, though. He gives John his answer, but he's not, he's not like upset with him. He's not rebuking him. He's just explaining and I think giving him comfort that, yeah, he is the Christ. But then he turns to everyone else, he, says, he turns to the multitude concerning John. He says, what went ye out into the wilderness to see a reed shaken with the wind? So was John just kind of a pushover? Was he someone who was just kind of tossed about? Or was he, was he dressed in really nice clothing and, and real refined? That wasn't John the Baptist. John wasn't a politician. He wasn't some orator that was always going to say the right things and please everybody. He wasn't someone you could just push around and, and if you challenge him on something, he'd just, he'd just be real quick to agree with you. Right? There's a lot of people out there that just want to be agreeable because they don't want to ever have a contradiction with someone and just be like, no, actually, I don't believe that. Because they don't have a spine, they don't have a backbone, or they don't like conflict so much that it just terrifies them to even contradict somebody else and say, well, actually, I don't believe that. Now, there's nothing wrong with disagreeing with people. <laughs> there's nothing wrong with having a different of, difference of opinion, but the, the, what the world is doing, the brainwashing is coming, especially from the left. The, the, the leftist propaganda that's coming out is just like, you need to accept this, and if you don't, then we're going to punish you. And this is the way that they've always worked. I mean, you go back and look at the communist countries and look at the socialist countries, and it's always this, this clamping down on being able to speak and this clamping down on having other thoughts and other ideas. And this is the way that our country is going today is, is getting into that. I'm going to get into that a little bit. I'm getting too far ahead of myself. I want to focus a little bit more on John here because Jesus is giving him he says here that he, you know, among them that are born of women, there's not arisen a greater than John the Baptist. So he's a great man. The best man to be born. He's a, he's a righteous guy. He's a great guy. And Jesus has really given him a lot of credit here. But he's not someone that's just a pushover. He's not someone that is just, you know, wearing these great fancy clothing and everything else. He's someone who basically just, just said it like it is. 
It doesn't matter who there. He wasn't a respecter of persons. And if he has to tell it to the king's face, he'll tell him, yeah, you know what? It's wicked. You shouldn't have your brother's wife. Not the king, the governor, whoever's in charge. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter who it is to John because he's going to preach the truth. <coughs> but I want to focus here on verse number six where Jesus Christ said, and blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. And one thing we need to make sure that we are never offended by or in is God or God's word. Because one of the attacks that people who hate God will try to use is they'll try to attack you with the Bible and they'll say, oh, but do you know the Bible? We just ran into someone last week so winning. Don't you know the Bible teaches slavery? No, the Bible doesn't teach slavery. It's a very ignorant comment, but that's what people come at you. And if you don't know, though, if, you, if you're ignorant of God's word, maybe you will get offended and, and you'll try to, you know, you'll backpedal and not know what to say. It doesn't teach slavery, but those are, this is one of the examples that people try to use. And they'll try to get you to backpedal or to be offended at something that the Bible says. As Bible believers, as believers of Jesus Christ, we should never be offended at anything that God's Word says. If God's Word says there's a death penalty for certain people, then you know what? We're not going to be offended by that. It is what it is. It's the truth. It's God's Word. We're going to accept that. We're going to exalt that because it's God's Word. God says, you're, Jesus said you're blessed when you're not offended in Him. You're not offended by the Bible. We need to be able to have thick skin and be able to endure what people have to say about us also for our faith. Because there's going to be people that will be falsely accusing you and saying all manner of evil against you falsely for Jesus Christ's sake and for the gospel's sake. And you have to expect that. And you have to be ready for that. And you have to not let these things get to you and not let that offend you. Unfortunately, some people, they can't handle it. They can't handle the persecution. They can't handle the attack and they end up giving up. They start serving God. They start doing what's right. They start cleaning up their life. They start going soul winning, but they can't handle just the things that other people might say to them. And it hurts them too much and they, they back off and they stop serving God or really, really minimize what they're doing at all because they don't like receiving that type of affliction. We need to have thick skin. We can't let that offend us. As I was mentioning just a minute ago, we live in this snowflake society that gets offended at everything. I mean, just, it's insane how degenerate society has become, just in general. Is, I found it real interesting. You look at, it's so hard to even have any type of discourse anymore at all in like even public events, even among people who call themselves scholars, just having a, uh, an intelligent, or at least trying to have an intelligent conversation of, say, a difference of opinions, a difference of ideas, especially when it comes to things, you know, politically or especially religiously, you know, it used to be where people had more respect, more manners, more intelligence to be able to handle hearing a difference of opinion. But these days, everyone has just gone crazy. I remember looking, and it's been a while since I've looked at any of this stuff, but watching some old programs, TV programs from, from like the 70s on uh, like talk shows where, and I don't mean the, the, the tabloid type talk, type talk shows. I mean like real talk shows where, where you'd have somebody that was, you know, f discussing some cause or um, some political ideology and then you'd have someone else that would have an opposing view and, you, and they'd go back and forth and they'd have like a debate or a discussion and talk back and forth and it was civilized and, you, and people would listen to each other and not yell over each other and scream over each other and be able to have a conversation. But it seems to be like that's impossible anymore. And the reason why is because people are just so focused on being offended and getting upset over what the person says that they can't handle. They don't even know how to, how to process the response when someone says something you don't like and they turn into these big babies and want to stop their ears and just have nothing to do with it. You see at these protests, if you've seen any of the videos online of protests where people will be like, um, I'm trying to think of a good example. And any of these stupid protests are going, a lot of them are dumb anyways, but 
you'll have people just trying to have a discussion with someone and then and then the other group will just start chanting you know black lives matter black lives matter whatever it's like or USA USA it's like someone's trying to have a have a discussion with you and you just have people who just can't handle it right so they just revert to this tactic of just well I'm just gonna yell louder than you and we can't even talk about it. but this this is where society is going and you know it's indicative of what's happening to many many people and it doesn't it's not just a type of attitude that happens at like a protest or a rally these things are going on and I think it's endemic uh, in, in systemic within the society and I think there's two main causes one is the ignorance of the people people are being dumbed down the, the youth especially are being dumbed down their education is not what it used to be the, the, the public school systems are turning into just public indoctrination centers instead of actual education. When they started off, they, they, they used to have a, a purpose of education. When education was socialized and, and, and given to the government to manage, which is never a good idea, but when that happened, there was, there was more of the motivation for people to be educated, but as time has progressed, there, there are wicked people in high places that are using these institutions to propagandize and to teach and indoctrinate children with whatever they feel they need to have. Now, this is not a slam on you know, any individual public school teachers. It's not. Because there's many well-meaning individuals out there that you know, and I'm sure there's plenty of classrooms where people, where kids are getting a, a, an education, where they're being taught. I'm not saying it just never, it doesn't exist anywhere. It, I'm not that radical and extreme to say that it's just impossible. Look, I grew up and went to public school personally. I went to myself and I learned a lot of things in public school. But to deny the influence of the of the especially the social agendas being crammed down kids throats and being standardized and put into curriculum and the fact that there are a lot of really wicked people who are trying to push their ideologies onto kids and they have that opportunity by getting into a classroom and being able to do that exists and it definitely is there i mean you can see the curriculums especially with the reading and book and, and the 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 LGBTQ, FYZ, the, 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 the homo agenda being pushed into the kids' classrooms for a very, very young age. And that is extremely wicked, and that's happening all over the place. And, and the reason why it's able to happen is because you've got a state that's able to control what's being given to the students, and you've got so many students now being impacted by that. But I've even seen it over the years the, the lowering of standards in general, the changing of curriculum, the, the changing of, of even you know, reading from, from the old classics that was actually good literature to now, well, we need to be more diverse. So instead of having these good authors that, that actually have intelligent reading and, and good stories, now they're getting some that ju it just has to be from some other you know, culture or background just, in, just for the sake of having diversity. It doesn't matter if it's really that good of a book. It doesn't matter what it's really teaching. It's just we need to have more diversity. So we're going to change up what the things that were good because it, it just needs to be more diverse. And that's what people are exalting as being uh, a, a virtue or a value that needs to be promoted. Also, children are not being taught to think critically anymore to challenge what they're being taught. It's, it's a system that's designed to just reward kids that will repeat what they're taught and what they're told. Not to think for themselves, just memorize facts, go through the process and, and get through. Look, I was able to get really, really, really good grades. I was a really good student, in, I know, in my public school and I can't remember ever being taught to th actually think critically and challenge things and to, to figure it out and learn it for myself. The reason why I was a good student is because I was able to, one, I showed up, I didn't screw around and just get in a lot of trouble, and that alone will let you pass the grade pretty much, <laughs> at least in the schools I was attending in, in Chicago area. You, just, you show up and you're not causing a bunch of problems, 
then you'll be just fine. You'll get through regardless of what you're actually learning. But on top of that, I was able to, to turn in the homework and repeat what I was told. So that made me a very good student. And that's what's going on in schools all over the place. Now, there's obviously there's a time to learn some facts and to learn some things. But the most important thing that, that children need to do is to be able to, to, to think for themselves and not just rely on what they're being told by anybody, but to be able to, to rationalize and think and understand. And this is, this is one of the main causes why we're t we've turned into this snowflake society. It's the ignorance and the, just the, the, the easily influenced youth or, or culture or pe people in general, whether it's youth or not. People just don't have very much critical thinking skills or very much smarts that makes them way more susceptible to, to influence by media, by someone who seems to be an authority. Oh, this is an expert, so I'm just going to trust them. And you can apply this in so many areas of your life. You know, we, we all ought to be able to think critically. Think critically when you go to church and you hear a preacher. Think critically when you go to a doctor and you hear advice that's given. Think critically when you go anywhere. And someone's going to try to educate you on something. Think critically about it. You can't just accept everything that you're being taught and told. But there's entire generations of people who are not being taught that great virtue of just being able to think and think critically. I mean, it's, it's so apparent. Just last week when I was out sewing, I was trying to talk to this girl. And she was a teenager. I can't tell exactly how old she was. Maybe uh, 16. I don't know. And just trying to teach the gospel to her, just trying to tell her about Jesus Christ. At 16, she didn't know what sin was. She didn't know what wages were. She didn't know what, what just, I mean, almost every single verse I was literally explaining as, as, to as rudimentary of a level as I possibly could. And then it even got so bad that when I said that Jesus paid for our sins, she didn't understand the concept of like paying for sin. And that, and that one almost stumped, it did stump me to how much more basic can you get to explain that, that he took a punishment so you don't have to. And I was, I was talking to this girl for I think about ten, five to ten minutes on this one point just trying to help her to understand. And at one point I even asked her, like, are you bored? Do you know, you know, just because I'm not going to waste my time with someone if they, you know, if they don't want to listen. Because sometimes people just be polite and will listen to you just because they're not trying to be rude or whatever. She said, no, no, no. I think she generally wanted to know, but was so ignorant and has just been held back and just, just mentally has not been taught not been taught good skills and thinking skills. She seemed like a really nice girl. It's sad, but this is what's happening, I think, more and more. And it's mind-boggling to run into people that it's just like, how do you not know even some of the most basic things? And it's going to be a real shame. She's a young girl, and I, I pray to God that someone will get the chance to speak to her again and help her to understand the gospel because it would be a crying shame if for her to go to hell simply because she didn't have the reasoning capacity to just, just fully understand the gospel, even though there's nothing wrong with her physically. But the other reason why I think we've got this society has gotten so bad with this, you know, type of snowflake society is not just the ignorance, but this overemphasis on people's feelings versus what's right and what's wrong. And it's become a very emotional type of uh, focus. So the focus on not offending people and being politically correct has trumped, has, has been more, is more important value-wise than just basic morality and right and wrong. It's this, this blurring of, of things like, you know, the, the, the sodomites is a perfect example. Because people want to tell you that, oh, well, it doesn't matter if you think that's right or wrong, we can't offend them. Don't say anything to offend them. I mean, it's, it's influenced people so much that even Bible believers are afraid to offend a pervert. Why are you afraid to offend? Why do you care? 
Why do you even care? Like, look, what does it even matter? If you have someone who's just an extremely wicked person, why do you care if you offend them? You know what? If, I, if I'm going to call, if, if I'm just going to just preach hard and rip on an adulterer or an adulteress, someone who's, who's cheated on their spouse and broken their wedding vows, I don't care if I offend them. I'm not going to tone it down so that I don't offend someone who's guilty of doing such a, such a horrible act. And it's, I mean, for what sake? For their sake? No, everyone else needs to hear how wicked and horrible it is. And it doesn't matter if it offends the person guilty of it because everyone else needs to understand, no, this is really bad. We're not going to do this. We're not going to tolerate this. But that's the key. It's the tolerance that's being pushed. They started off with a proper tolerance, I believe. And this is what, when I say I believe, I believe that this is how it started off from, from my understanding just of history. Tolerance being taught for, say, different races, right? Of course, we ought to be tolerant to accept any race because that there's, there's no reason not to be. The Bible says we're all made of one blood. It's not that that doesn't mean the color of a person's skin has nothing to do with morality or right and wrong at all. So people who are using that to, to make a judgment on someone is, is wrong. It's, that's not right. But then they, they go from that and start applying that same principle to things that are of moral value, that, that, that are determined morally and not just physically. So they start taking the actions of people and applying that to the same category as someone just based on the skin color. Now, I don't know about you, but I would be pretty offended because people will, will liken this all the time of a, a sodomite, a homosexual, to like some minority group, a black person or, or a Hispanic person or whatever, right? If someone were to say, you know, I mean, I'm white. I'm not, I'm not in a minority group. But if someone were to say, oh, well, it's just like, you know, this sodomite's just like you being white, I'd be like, uh, no, it's not at all. <laughs> you know, I'd be really offended at that, trying to say that, that someone choosing to be a pervert is the same as just the color of the skin that I was born with. They're two completely different things. And it's, and it's nonsense. But that's what's being, that's what people are being programmed with today. This overemphasis on people's feelings, this political correctness, and this, this pushing of things that are, that are supposed to be moral judgments and applying them the way they're not. Now, the Bible says in Proverbs 27, 6, faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. We ought to, we ought to like it when people try to correct us and not just be offended, especially if they're correcting you with God's word. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. We need to not just be offended easily. Psalm 119, 165. Turn, if you would, to Isaiah 29. Isaiah 29. Psalm 119, verse 165 says, Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. See, when you love God's law, what are you going to be offended by? If you love everything that God's word says, you love his law, Hey, if you're guilty of God's law, you're not going to be offended at it. You're going to get right because you love the law, because you know that it's right. You know it's good. You're going to follow it. You're not going to get offended at anything that it says. But one of the things that we're facing today that's very relevant is this push to make hate speech illegal. And they start off using a very vague term, just, you know, hate speech. So you think, think of the word hate, right? And this is, this is so indicative of what, I mean, it's, it's actually very clever when you think about it, because it's very subtle. But they'll take a word, like, I mean, if, you just, if, if you're just kind of clear your thoughts, and you just think of the word hate. 
Hate's not, it's not going to give you a good feeling, right? It's not going to evoke a good response. It's going to be a negative response. It's going to be something that you're going to respond to just naturally, intrinsically, as maybe being kind of opposed to. You think of, oh, hate, yeah, I don't like that. It's not a good feeling, right? We, lo we like love. It's something that is positive. It's good. Hate, bad, love, good, right? These are things that, that at a very base level, when you just hear it without any context, without knowing anything else, you're just going to hear that and be like, oh, okay, yeah. So when people start saying, well, we want to cut down on hate. Well, overall, sure, yeah, we want to cut down on hate. But what's the context? See, they're going to be very vague about it. And they get people to just accept, oh, well, yeah, hate is bad. Hate is bad. Hate is bad. Well, hate's not always bad. There's, always a, there's definitely a time that we need to hate. I'm going to get into that a little later. But, but there's, there's definitely a time where we need to be able to hate things. Bibles and Ecclesiastes are a time for war, a time for peace, a time to love, and a time to hate. There is a time for it. There is an appropriate place to have that. But when, when you just start hearing these real vague terms over and over and over again, that's how the brainwashing works. But the fact that we have these people that even would make hate speech a law, because think about what's hate speech. It's, it's what you say. Speech. Just the words that come out of your mouth are just going to become illegal because someone is offended at what you've said or because it's deemed by somebody to be hateful, to be not loving. Look at Isaiah chapter 29, verse number 18. Because the Bible describes the type of person that would even create a hate speech law, believe it or not. It's found in Isaiah 29, verse number 18. The Bible says, And in that day shall the deaf hear the words of the book, and the eyes of the blind shall see out of obscurity and out of darkness. The meek also shall increase their joy in the Lord, and the poor among men shall rejoice in the Holy One of Israel. So we're going to see a contrast here. Obviously, these are, verses 18 and 19, very good things. Talking about the deaf hearing, the blind receiving their sight, right? The meek increasing their joy. The poor among men shall rejoice in the Holy One of Israel. But look at verse number 20. For the terrible one is brought to naught. So the reason why these people are rejoicing is because the terrible one is brought to nothing and the scorner is consumed and all that watch for iniquity are cut off. The people that are watching just trying to accuse someone and, and, and bring iniquity on them, it says that make, so this is continuing on with that same type of person, the terrible one, the scorner. Verse 21, that make a man an offender for a word. It makes someone guilty or an offender just for saying something, just at a word. That's what that means. That make a man an offender for a word and lay a snare for him that reproveth in the gate and turn aside the just for a thing of naught. Now it says there, after make a man an offender for a word, lay a snare or a trap for him that reproveth in the gate. Throughout the Bible, you'll see that when, when men are known in the gates, they sit in the gates for their wisdom. People come to them for knowledge. Um, because they know God's law and they'll reprove or tell people they're wrong because they're esteemed and they know God's law they're, and they're going to be telling people they're wrong in the gate. So it says here that the wicked person is going to lay a trap for him that reproveth in the gate because they hate God's word. They're going to make a man an offender for a word. That's the, the terrible one. That's the scorner. That's those that look for iniquity. That's wicked people are going to try to create these types of laws. Now, God's law has nothing in it associated with, with saying hateful things or committing a crime and then adding to, well, the crime's going to be even a, a stronger punishment if we find out that hate was involved. This is one of the stupidest things. This actually is on the books today. Even though there is no, it's called a hate crime. So currently, we don't have a law against hate speech. That if you say something that someone deems to be hateful, that's not against the law yet. But what is against the law is what they've done is they've taken regular crimes, right? Of course, it's a crime to kill someone, to, you know, to, to injure someone, you know, when you fight someone, you have assault, you've got battery, you could, you could hurt someone, you physically injure them. These are all crimes that you could commit against someone else, evil you could bring upon someone else. But now what they've done is they've just said, well, if hate is involved, then it's worse. And this is the stupidest thing in the world. This is what I'm talking about, being able to think critically. Because there's just an agenda behind this. It's about 
um, normalization and acceptance and tolerance of certain perverts than it actually has to do with something that makes sense. Because if someone's going to get in a fight or murder somebody or try to harm somebody, they're not doing it because they love them, <laughs> right? Hate is going to be intrinsic to all of these crimes where you're hurting somebody. So just saying, well, this specific crime, well, that's a hate crime. Even vandalism. Even vandalism. You don't, you don't vandalize someone's property because you love them. I mean, it's just, it's stupid. It doesn't make any sense. But what they want to do is they'll, they'll take all these things and say, well, this is a hate crime. So that's going to be even, you know, punishable by even more. Well, if you determine a certain act to be worthy of a certain punishment, why does it matter what their intent is, really? Like if it's, if you're harming someone or vandalizing someone, the crime's a crime. You, you, it is what it is. You can't, you can't add more to it. And God's word never has anything like that found within the pages of the Bible. Now, we know that things are only going to continue to get worse. Matthew chapter 24, verse number 8, the Bible says, All these are the, beginnings of so the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you, and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. So we know that the hatred is going to increase. People are being polarized. There's, there's people that are wicked are becoming more wicked. And I even think that people who are, who are kind of righteous are becoming more righteous. And we're seeing a polarization. And you got a lot of people in between. But as the times, as the end times get closer and closer and closer, the hatred is going to increase. And especially against Christians against believers and they're they're introducing these ways to attack Christians this is part of the agenda and I'm gonna go into this more tonight it's kind of, it's almost a two-part sermon it's, they're slightly different but they're definitely related to each other and, and as I mentioned you know it's very clever to criminalize speech just by calling it hate speech they haven't done it yet, but this is, this is the push. This is what they're trying to do. They use these terms like hate bad, right? Love good, hate bad. Think about, I, I don't know what it's like here, but in Arizona, they're constantly trying to raise more money for the, for the public school. So like they have all these slogans. Every time it's, it's um, you know, voting season or whatever, you have these signs like vote yes on whatever. It's for the children. We care about the police. We care about you. And they'll say all these things that it's just like they, they try to, to take sometimes a complex issue or sometimes an issue that really has nothing to do with that. They'll say, oh, it's just like one of the ones I said, well, every, every child's worth two cents. When they are trying to do a 2% increase in taxes, they say, well, every child's worth two cents. Yeah, two cents on the dollar. <laughs> that, there's a big difference between, yeah, of course. I mean, who's going to disagree with that statement? Yeah, every child's worth, I think they're worth a little bit more than two cents, right? Yeah, they're really valuable. But that doesn't mean that we want to just tax, you know, just raise taxes by 2%. You know, it's like, it's, but this is the way that propaganda works. And we have to be able to see through that and to cut through that and not just use the little slogans and the, you know, the, the things that, that people will state, just these one-off statements to come to a conclusion about. Just, oh, hate bad. Hate speech is just bad. We just need to just get rid of hate speech. Turn, if you would, to Isaiah chapter 5. I think you're in Isaiah already. If you turn to Isaiah chapter 5. Our world has everything backwards. We know this. The things of the world are not of the Father. But just to, to show you, to demonstrate how bad things are, I think Jesus said it really well in Matthew 18. Your turn to Isaiah 5. But these days, people are more concerned about the feelings of a predator than they are about being offended by what the predator does to the victim. 
What am I talking about? Well, these days, you're going to be censored. You can't say anything if you're going to say something offensive about a sodomite, about a pervert, right? A homo, if I call a homo a fag or a faggot, right? That's going to be, oh, you can't say that because that's going to offend these guys. That's going to offend these queers. You might upset them and you can't do that. You can't, no, that's mean. You, you can't say anything derogatory. Really? Well, what about the kids that are being molested by these perverts? I care about them way more than I care about offending the predator that's going after them. Jesus said in Matthew 18, 6, but whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me. He was surrounded by children in the context here. He says, you offend one of these little ones that believe in some saved child of God, some little child that believe in me. He said, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and that he were drowned in the depth of the sea. One of these perverts going and, and you think Jesus could worry about offending that person when he's saying it's better for them? It's better. It's better. How, I mean, how bad is it to have a millstone tied around your neck and just be tossed over into the sea and just drown and have that, that stone carry you to the bottom of the sea? He says, you know what? That's better. It's better that that would happen than you offend one of these little ones that believe in him. Why? Because Jesus is going gonna, is gonna to really bring the judgment down upon those wicked people. But before these predators go and, and harm any one of these little children, they should just take that millstone themselves and throw it overboard into the sea and kill themselves before they go and do harm to one of these ones because that would be better for them. According to Jesus Christ himself, I didn't make that up. But woe to this world. Isaiah chapter 5, look at verse number 20. The Bible says, Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. Woe unto them that are mighty to drink wine and men of strength to mingle strong drink. There are all these woes. We live in a world today that is calling evil good. And they're calling good evil. When we live in a world that, that you know, Baptist churches, Bible-believing Christians are just being censored because what you're saying is bad. You're saying that's evil. You guys are evil. You have hate speech. You're not loving. That's bad because you're preaching the Bible, because you're teaching God's word, and they're calling them that are evil good. No, these are the people we want to tolerate. These are the people we want to accept. These are the people that can say and push whatever filth they want online to the whole world. That's just fine. We'll accept that. We'll let them put whatever they want out there, but you're evil. Woe unto you. Woe unto you, Facebook. Woe unto you, you know, all these other YouTube. Woe unto you that's calling good evil and evil good. Woe unto them that are mighty to drink wine and men of strength to make a strong drink. Verse number 23, which justify the wicked for reward and take away the righteousness of the righteous from you. You know, there's a lot of people, a lot of people are influenced by the sodomite community that has a lot of money to just give donations and stuff. And that's why so many people are just bought off. A lot of politicians and people will just allow this stuff to happen because they're justifying the wicked for reward, for their own gain, for their own benefit. People who ought to be more concerned about what's right and wrong, they just care about getting that reward. And they'll justify the wicked in order to do so. Verse 24, Therefore, as the fire devoureth the stubble and the flame consumeth the chaff, so their root shall be as rottenness and their blossom shall go up as dust because they have cast away the law of the Lord of hosts and despised the word of the Holy One of Israel. But it doesn't just stop there because there's woe to the Christian that follows the world and not Jesus. Look at verse number 25. Therefore is the anger of the Lord kindled against His people. Against his people, and he hath stretched forth his hand against them and hath smitten them. And the hills did tremble, and their carcasses were torn in the midst of the streets. For all this, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. And you know, I expect 
the world to call good evil and evil good. I expect that out of them. Why? Because they don't know. They don't have the truth. They don't know the truth. But woe unto the believers. They're going to take sides with the world. They're going to take sides with the perverts. That's what boggles my mind. And you know what? Woe unto you that, that will promote perversion and you stand against people who are actually trying to preach the, preach the truth. That, that boggles my mind. And you know what? It makes God angry. God's, the anger of the Lord is kindled against his people when they're, not, when they're on the wrong side of things, especially these moral issues. So why does all this matter, this hate speech? Why should, why should you care? Well, there's a lot of people that are trying to criminalize our beliefs. That's why. They're actually trying to make it a crime. Your thoughts... Uh, and I mentioned, this, I was going into this at the beginning of the sermon, there's nothing new under the sun because this has happened many, many times before, especially in the communist countries. You know, you're, you're not allowed to challenge what they say, what the government says, what the people in charge, the people in authority say you can and cannot do or think. And that's where it got really bad. Read history. The people who don't know history, they're doomed to repeat it. You read the books. There's people that, that still are, have survived these type of wicked regimes in, in, in countries that they were in where they would have these, these secret police that were around to just spy on people and tell, and it even split up families where people would just, you, you, you know, there was, there was such fear of people just saying the wrong thing and being punished for it because, because there was crimes against thought, against thinking. You don't want to live in a, in a society like that. And the more socialist our country becomes, the more communist it becomes, the more censorship we're going to see. I mean, look at China. Look at, look at the examples. Just look at the examples. They start off trying to get the most radical people. Because what most people will do is just say, well, it's not me, so I don't care. Or I don't like what they have to say anyways. Every time you say that, well, I don't care what they have to say anyways, you're just accepting that you don't, ultimately, you don't value that freedom for people to be able to say what they want to say very much. Because if you don't like what they have to say, it doesn't mean that they don't have the right to say it. Those are two different things. We're seeing way more censorship these days and more bullying and silencing of opposing views. All the social media sites, YouTube, Fagbook, Google, Twitter, you know, all these places, they, they want to silence the message. They don't like Christianity. They don't like the Bible. And they're going to attack. Now, they don't have a, a hate speech law yet, so they have their own policies and their own rules. And they could, you know, censor people whenever they want, ultimately. But they're not even stopping there. And see, here's what you have to understand about the wicked people is that they are implacable and they are unmerciful. And they will stop at nothing. Nothing's ever good enough for them, ever. They're going to keep pushing until hate speech becomes a law. And as long as it's not, though, they're going to find any other means that they can to attack. And this is, this is where it brings me to the point where, you know, things have happened recently. And they've been happening. This isn't brand new. But it just kind of lit a fire under my butt to think to, to want to preach on this. Is that now they're going so far as to start shutting people down and shutting down even their, their finances from being able to collect money or receive donations because these people that hate God, these really wicked people out there are trying to silence any opposing viewpoint because they want to have the ear of everybody with no opposition. And they want to dictate and they want to control and they want to shut everybody else down. And just recently, Steadfast Baptist Church, re, you know, lost their ability to receive money. I was talking to Pastor Romero about it and they get, you know, they're put on a list. 
they're put on a list so that any of these financial you know, you have, you have all these different payment processors, right? If you're familiar with this at all, there's, you know, if you have a website and you want to collect donations, there's different ways that you could collect money from people. But ultimately, you, you know, you may think you have all these different options of companies you can go with, but there's really only a couple at the top and that's what really matters. You're gonna have like MasterCard and Visa are the two main financial institutions. So all of these other groups, you know, you've got your Patreon and GoFundMe and whatever and all these other ways that you could collect money, they're all going through the main company. So if you get flagged on one of those, you know, MasterCard says, we don't like hate speech, then in their system, everybody who uses that MasterCard system, well, we can't, we can't work with you. You're not allowed to do business and just try to shut them down. Now, obviously with a church, you know, we have local churches that are, that are financed locally, you know, to continue doing things. But what they're doing is, and it's not just with the church. I mean, Steadfast has had this happen. Faithful Word has had this happen. Verity Baptist Church has all had, they've all had this happen. You have to keep on going and trying to find other ways to just be able to receive money for people who appreciate what you're doing and want to fund and, and help you to produce even more, right? The, the local church should be self-sufficient to be able to take care of itself, but all of the other projects, all the extra things that are being done, all the major projects that are being funded with these great soul winning marathons and, and these extra you know, trips and documentaries and everything else is being pushed out and being able to fund that is coming from not just the local congregations, but from people all over the place as well to really be able to fund everything that's being done. Now, we, you know, God doesn't need money but this is i'm just bringing this up to show you that you know the people that that hate god they're doing everything that they can to make sure that they're going to try to shut you down and to shut us down and we need to we need to use our reasoning skills and our and our ability to think and to think through things and not just to accept when someone says oh yeah hate speech is bad we need to outlaw it you start thinking of the ramifications of what that actually means and how, are they, how is it going to be applied? And who's going to be in charge of determining what's hate and what's not? It's time to wake up. Even the more mild groups that just are you know, conservative in nature are being shut down. Alex, the Alex Jones channel got just pulled from YouTube and stuff. And, and you know, I'm not endorsing Alex Jones, but it's just like, of all people, I mean, yeah, there's some things up there that a lot of people get upset about, but I mean, really? Is there, was there anything really on there? It was just, oh man, no one could listen to this guy at all. We're just going to just pull everything down from someone who's got, who people actually like and listen to. But just for, for an institution to say, no, I don't like what you have to say, and I don't care if millions of people do like what you have to say, we're just going to silence you and, and not give you that outlet to, to speak what you want to speak. There's other groups. I found this when I was trying to, to help out with Pastor Romero because obviously we need to know about this stuff too, even though we haven't been attacked yet. We're a brand new church. You know, this is going to impact us eventually. And this is what I'm saying. We can't just sit back. You can't just sit back and wait for it to happen to you. When you start to see these things happening, we need to start taking action immediately, right away. Now, we, you know, we're not dummies. We're, we're smart. We know that things are going to continue to get worse and worse. I'm not saying that we could necessarily just completely stop the world from, from turning this way. We know eventually it's going to happen. We know that there is going to come a time when we can't buy or sell anymore. We, you know, we know that that's going to happen. We can see how it's being implemented, but we, what we can do, though, is still try our best right now to fight it off and to stay that from happening as much as possible. There's this group called the Southern Poverty Law Center, which is really, it's, all it is is just a mouthpiece for everything that's communist and leftist. They started off being, you know, again, what I was talking about, taking up um, you know, racial, racially motivated type crimes and things like that. So 
they, they started off fighting against, you know, the Ku Klux Klan and some, and some groups that were, you know, doing things against other people based on their race. Right? And, you know, and, and yeah, I mean, I, I'm not going to get into all of that either. But obviously, when crimes are being committed and there's, you know, it's wrong. And, I'm, and you know, the Ku Klux Klan is stupid and, and the neo-Nazis and whatever, all these movements. But they've, they've kind of conquered them and beat them. You know, they, they went on their mission and, and, and you know, uh, trying to, to, to get rid of these, of these groups that I think more legitimately can be seen as hate groups as far as just, just not having a good... Um, and there I go, look. I'm going to correct myself right there because now I'm getting sucked into this and this is the way it works. I, do you notice I just said they are a hate group. This is how the brainwashing works. They start introducing terms and the more you hear it over and over and over and over and over and over and over again, you come to accept that term as even being valid. And we're all susceptible to that. I'm not endorsing the KKK, just so, you did, just so you know, okay? What I'm against, though, is using these types of labels and saying, oh, well, they're just some hate group because that, what we see is this just starts getting applied to everyone else. You could know what that group's about without using the generic terms. And there's a justified reason for... for groups that are committing crimes against other people to be stopped from committing those crimes. But as much as I don't agree with what they stand for, if they're not committing crimes, I think they should be allowed to exist and speak whatever they want to speak. Even if it's something that I think is, is repugnant. They should at least be able to say it. I mean, yeah, when, when you're committing crimes against people and, and doing things that are, you know, the, of course, well, we already have laws for that. They ought to be punished for that. But you start getting into this, this weird area of calling things just, just hate crimes and hate speech, you, you're going it, to, it's going to have unintended consequences for people who are actually trying to just preach the truth. Now, just to give you an idea of the Southern Poverty Law Center, here's a couple of things that, that they've, uh, how extreme they are. I copied this from, from Wikipedia. It says, in 2002, the Southern Poverty Law Center and the American Civil, Civil Liberties Union filed suit, Glassworth versus, Monroe, versus Moore, against Alabama Supreme Court Chief Justice Roy Moore for placing a display of the Ten Commandments in the rotunda of the Alabama Judicial Building. So a judge wanted to put the Ten Commandments in the judicial building. I don't know, it sounds like a good thing to me. It sounds like someone that I would want being a judge if they at least are going to exalt the Ten Commandments of the Bible and say this is, this is just and this is you know, a symbol of justice. Now, I don't know. I know this guy's been in the news a lot and everything else. I don't know a lot about this guy. I don't believe everything that I see just because it's reported in the newspaper, but I don't know anything about it, so don't think. Again, this isn't an endorsement of this person. I don't really know him. But just to show you how extreme the Southern Poverty Law Center is, is that so this guy put this Ten Commandments statue at the judicial building. It says, Moore, who had final authority over what decorations were to be placed in the Alabama State Judicial Building's rotunda had installed a 5,200-pound granite block, three feet wide by three feet deep by four feet tall, of the Ten Commandments, late at night, without the knowledge of any other court justice. So they're already, even the way that they're writing this, it's like, they just said that he had the authority to do this, but then they say, well, he did it late at night and no one else even knew about it, like trying to spin it. If he had either he had the, the authority to do it or not, right? And it says, after defying several court rulings, Moore was eventually removed from the court and the Supreme Court justices had the monument removed from the building. This is all because the Southern Poverty Law Center just went after this guy for, for erecting the Ten Commandments at a court. 
That's how much they hate God in the Bible. You can't do that. You can't put the Ten Commandments up at a place of justice. What are you thinking? In October 2014, the Southern Poverty Law Center added Ben Carson. Remember Ben Carson ran for president? Seventh-day Adventist? Added Ben Carson to its extremist watch list. Yeah, he's a real extremist. And again, this isn't an endorsement of Ben Carson. Okay? <laughs> I don't like him either. There's a lot of things that he believes that I don't agree with. But he's hardly an extremist. Okay? He's, he's pretty milk toast on a lot of things. But no, the Southern Poverty Law Center, why? Because they don't like here, the, the one thing is because he has any type of attachment with, with calling homos, you know, perverts. And it says here, it says, he was added to the extremist watch list, citing his association with groups it considers extreme. So he's associated with these other groups that the Southern Poverty Law Center thinks are extreme. So he said, well, you're an extremist. And his linking of gays with pedophiles. Uh, yeah, sorry, Southern Poverty Law Center, but that's a fact. It's not an opinion of linking gays with pedophiles. It's a fact that there is the, 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 the statistical evidence that shows how much higher it is statistically with homos than it is with straight people. And anyone who's a straight that's a pedophile, they're not straight. They're crooked. They're perverted. They fall into that same category. It says, following criticism, the Southern Poverty Law Center concluded its profile of Carson did not meet its standards, removed his listing, and apologized to him in February 2015. Yeah, after they slander him and, and you know, put him up on this group and, you know, all the liberal media will, will take the Southern Poverty Law Center stuff and run with it as, it as if there's some authority anyways. And you know what's funny? They're not. They're not an authority. They're just some group that, I, I mean, who knows why People, it's because, it's because it's that group think and the, and the left likes what they're doing, what they say, so they're just going to promote that. But they, they don't have any real authority. And what's ironic about all of it is that the Southern Poverty Law Center, they hate too. They should, they should list themselves as a hate group. Oh, hate so bad, we can't hate anything. You're a hate group. They hate anyone that thinks homos are perverts. They hate them. That's why they go after them. That's why it's their mission to destroy them. And they'll say that they are actually out to destroy people that believe that. That is their mission. Well, I'm sorry. You don't love someone if you're out to destroy them. You're a hate group. They hate anyone that wants to criminalize sodomy. And it's funny what they'll say is, because they have to put a statement out there, well, we don't, we don't hate the Bible. We don't hate Christians. They just hate people who actually believe what it says and will actually say what it says. Because they don't want to just target everyone. That would be too broad of a base to say we hate Christians. They just come out and say it. But you know what? They actually do. They know what the Bible says. They know what these people, but you know what they do? They call them an extremist. You know, if more believers would actually, would actually believe, <laughs> would actually stand up for the word of God, then someone saying that sodomites ought to be put to death wouldn't be extreme. It wouldn't sound extreme to anybody if more believers actually took their Bible and said, you know what, I believe that. You know what, I love the law of the Lord. Nothing's going to offend me. I love this. I think we should have this. And more people said, yeah, I believe this book. This is truth. And I think that if we had any wisdom at all, we would model our laws after God's law. If more, if more people who claim to believe the Bible would actually believe it and stand up for it, none of this would be extreme. It would be impossible for someone to say, oh, you're an extremist group. Well, yeah, if, if over 50% of the people are extremists, that's not extreme anymore. But how many people claim to be Christian? No, the Southern Poverty Law Center is a hate group. They hate, they hate the Bible. You can't be for something unless you're against the opposite. 
You can't, you can't have love without hate. You, they go hand in hand. It's, it's impossible to just love everybody and everything. The easiest example, you say to someone, oh, but I love everybody. Do you love Adolf Hitler? Do you love Joseph Stalin? Do you love these people? Because they'll never tell you yes. How could you love a person that's, in, in regardless of what you even think about there, how could you love someone who's responsible for just genocide or deaths of millions of people? They're just evil, wicked people. How could you say you love that person? If you love that person, you can't love the people that they harmed. You, just, you can't have it both ways. And this is why the whole term is stupid, just the, you know, the hate speech. After enough pushing through the media, people that may have strongly opposed legislation at first have gotten used to the idea of even hate speech being a thing. And that's what I say, even, even to the point to where during my preaching I'm using this, this term as, as a legitimate term. Whereas the first time, I remember the first time I heard it, it was just like, what are you talking about? Like that's not even a thing. It's not even real. People just invented it, made it up, and they just use it over and over again until it becomes a thing, until it becomes real. And then it just wears on us and until you just accept it, and then they start to push it through. But then watch out for the distractions, too, because when, when the wicked people try to push these things tr through, they'll, they'll distract you with something else. Anyways, I, I'm starting to ramble now. We're going to cut it right there, but... This is a serious issue. Why is this important? Because this is one of the ways that Christianity is being attacked today. And this is one of the labels. This is, what's try, well, this is what the wicked people that hate God are trying to use against the truth, against the Bible, and against those that will preach God's word. And they're trying to, to make us look bad by using these stupid terms that don't really have really solid meaning by people who are ignorant. We need to make sure that we are not ignorant, that we know what's going on, and that we are not ever offended in God's word, but we would stand for God's word. And you know what? Provoke others to stand for God's word. We can't just sit back and be quiet. We need to, to exalt God's word and, and let it be known and shout it from the rooftops. Let's bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, Thank you so much for the Bible. Pray that you would please just give us wisdom and instruction and knowledge, dear Lord. Help us in the midst of this crooked and perverse nation to just be lights and lighthouses to, that'll just sh share the truth and spread it far and wide and not be ashamed and not be offended, Lord, but that we would um, learn to, to take any criticisms and any persecutions and not let that deter us, dear Lord, but that we would continue to fight in the fight that we have before us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.